All right, welcome back. We're still in John, I think. We haven't quite finished chapter three. Last week we talked about that beloved passage from uh, verse 316 up to, I think we ended at verse 21. Yes, sir. So now we're ready to talk about John the Baptist again. And again, as, as we noted early on in, in John, a lot of what's going on in John is the old giving way to the new. And so you'll have water giving way to wine. The temple is going to give way to the body of Jesus. And then, of course, John the Baptist himself will give way to Jesus. John has already said, or will say, uh, he must increase, I must decrease. John will decrease, and Jesus' uh, Jesus' fame, I don't want to say fame like that's what he's seeking, but you know, if, if a man is teaching as Jesus does and healing as Jesus does, the word gets around. And so Jesus' name becomes better known as John becomes less and less. And that's, that's where we find ourselves in John chapter 3. Let's open with prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all that you have done for us, for taking on our flesh, for joining us in our, in our, uh, livelihood, in, in our life, for taking on um, our flesh and our bones, living the life that we live, walking among us and teaching, revealing the, the kingdom of the Father to us. We thank you for sending your servant, John the Baptist, to prepare the way for you and for setting us an example of decreasing as you increase. So like your servant, John, help us to decrease in ourselves while you increase. Let our lives be turned toward you. Do this by your word, by your spirit, as you have promised you would. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right. John 3, 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. So uh, John the Evangelist has spoiled it for us. John will end up in prison. Um, I, I've handed out this full-color map for you to look at. It's a good one to have on hand. If you, you might have something like this in your Bible. If you don't, it's, it's a good thing to keep in there. This is a, a map of the area in which Jesus ministered, you know, those, those three years from his baptism to his resurrection. The three most important places here are going to be Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Now, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, which is just outside of Jerusalem, right there in Judea. And as we talked about on Wednesday, Judea is the, the name of the Roman province derived from the name Judah, right? That was the tribal land of the tribe of Judah, which during the days of Jeroboam and Rehoboam became the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, it is not sovereign, it is a province ruled by Rome, although Rome will rule it by kind of regional or, or territorial rulers. In this case, that's going to be Herod. Um, Galilee is where Jesus grows up. If you remember, the, the Holy Family has to depart from Bethlehem rather quickly because Herod is trying to kill all the firstborn of Bethlehem in order to prevent the rise of a rival king. They flee to Egypt which is a very common place in the Bible to hide out while a king's trying to kill you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we found that out with Jeroboam. When they return, though, they do not go back to Bethlehem. They go back to Nazareth, which is where Joseph is from. And so that's where he's raised. Nazareth is in Galilee. Galilee as an area is a mixture of Jew and Gentile, but it's mostly Gentile right? You'll have Jewish settlements in there. Between uh, Judea and Galilee is the province of Samaria. Samaria gets its name from the northern kingdom of Israel, becomes known as Samaria. And so the Roman province just takes its name from that. 
Samaria is inhabited by the Samaritans. We'll talk more about the Samaritans when we get to chapter 4. But right now, Jesus, in John, Jesus is mostly in Galilee. Or, I'm sorry, in, in Judea. Whereas in the synoptics, we hear most of his time in Galilee. However, in John, he does go to Galilee, and that's where he is in this latter part of chapter 3. And what's going on is that John's ministry is still ongoing. John the Baptist is still preaching. He's still baptizing. What Jesus is doing in Galilee is helping John in his ministry. He's helping John to fulfill his, his ministry. And so he goes, uh, he goes up to Galilee, and they're in the... They're in the um, Sorry, he's in the Judean countryside. He's, he's still in Judea. He will go up to Galilee in a minute. John is baptizing in Enon. Water's plentiful there. People are coming to him. And now we're going to find out the, the discussion that's been going on. Verse 25. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came out to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. So these are disciples of John the Baptist, and they come up to John and they say, you know, that, that man that was with you across the Jordan, that one you said you were, you were bearing witness of, which... To what degree did they really understand what it meant that John was bearing witness to him? Obviously, there's still some deficiency, right? They didn't understand that that one to whom John was bearing witness was the whole point of John's life and ministry. So, you remember that man you said you bore witness of? And of course, John knows him rather well. Yes, of course. Um, He's baptizing. Now, is this just a mere statement like he's baptizing? What's, what's hidden within this, this comment? Yeah, it's, it's a complaint. Right. And, and there's a question. Should, should he be doing this? Should he be baptizing? Because, John, you've been baptizing. And now Jesus is baptizing. And, you know, is, is, is he a competitor to you? Is this... Is this a rivalry? Did, did, is there bad blood between the two of you? What's, should he be doing this? Should we stop him? Should we call the authorities? Should the Sanhedrin know about it? And, and, and everybody's still going to John. Or sorry, everybody's going to Jesus. So Jesus, um, or, or, or sorry, John, John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So, what did John just say Jesus was? The Christ, yeah, the Messiah. I've been telling you that I'm not the Christ. That is, that is as consistent as could be in the preaching of John. I am not the Christ. Because he is obviously a, a climactic kind of figure. It would be easy to think of John as the Christ. People are drawn to him. God is obviously gathering people to come and hear him. He's proclaiming that the kingdom is near. This sounds like the Christ, which is why John is always saying, even when people ask him, who are you? He doesn't start with who he is. He starts with who he's not. I'm not the Christ. He says that so that there's no ambiguity. And these disciples of John, this Jesus guy, who who is he? What's he doing? And John says, look, no one knows anything unless unless it's given him from above meaning John was given a word from above. How was John given the word from above that Jesus is the Christ? John baptized Jesus. 
And, and how did John hear the Father's voice? Yeah, immediately. By immediately, I don't mean right away. What I mean is there was no mediator, right? It wasn't spoken through another prophet. He heard the voice of the Father directly. This is my beloved Son. So John knows that Jesus is the Christ. And he reminds his disciples, I'm not the Christ. Implying, but Jesus is. He continues, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John is saying it's okay. It's okay that he's increasing. That's how it has to be. That's how it's supposed to go. I, John, am supposed to decrease. He, Jesus, is supposed to increase. But before he says that, he calls Jesus something. We've already heard that Jesus is the Word. We've heard that Jesus is the Lamb. And now we're going to hear that Jesus is the Bridegroom. Now, in American English, this usually gets shortened to the word groom to distinguish the bridegroom from the bride. So even though the word bride is in there, that's the man's part in a wedding, right? Not the woman's part. The bridegroom is the man who is being married, right? And a bridegroom is taking a bride. And throughout the Bible, this relationship between God and his church, the Christ and his church, will be described as a wedding. I mean, today our gospel reading in, in church is the parable of the great banquet. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who throws a great feast, a wedding feast. And in this, in this image, the bridegroom is Christ. Who's the bride? The church. Now, that, that doesn't mean that, you know, sex and gender don't exist and men are really supposed to be women. It's corporate, right? The church together is the bride of Christ. So male Christians are still the bridegroom in their own home, right? They're still the man, the head. But as the church, the church is the bride, right? And the bride is presented to the groom. Of course, at a wedding, the bride is always necessarily what? As beautiful as she can possibly be, right? Jesus prepares his bridegroom by doing what? Washing her, right? So that he can present herself to him a spotless bride, a perfect bride. Note that the bride in herself, apart from the, the washing of the bridegroom, is not spotless. But because the bridegroom has washed the bride, we are presented, corporately as the church, as a spotless bride because he's washed us. Right, with his blood. Well, and, and they don't get it all, all right away, and that's fine. It's an awesome motto for Christians. I've, I used to see uh, bumper stickers that had something like that. You know, bumper stickers, they're, they're sometimes kind of goofy. That one's not bad, actually. If you're going to have a bumper sticker, you could do worse. Um, but there's another person in, in the wedding that John mentions, and that is the friend of the bridegroom, right? We might use the term the best man or a groomsman. And the best man rejoices to hear the bridegroom's voice. You know, I do. That's why they're there, right? Who's the friend of the bridegroom? John, right? John is not the bridegroom. He's the friend of the bridegroom. He's bearing witness. That's a lot of the purpose of the best man and, and the, the groomsman, right? Is to bear witness to the event. So, John says, because of this, his joy is complete. That is, this is the whole purpose. This is, 
This is not out of order, dear disciples, John says. This is how it should be. And because of this, his joy is complete. 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Sounds a bit like John 3, 16 and 17, right? But it also sounds a little bit like Jesus' words to Nicodemus. He who comes from above is above all. Now, does that mean that Jesus is above John? Yes, but it's not just that he's one rank higher. It means that Jesus is not the best of the earthly men. Jesus comes from above, which is to say he's higher than John in that he has a different origin. Infinite, right, yeah, immeasurably. Jesus comes from above. And if you remember, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born from above. And earlier in John, we heard that those who are born are born not of flesh, but of, but of God. Right? So Jesus, what John is really saying is that Jesus comes from heaven. Jesus is above all. Jesus bears witness to what he has seen. Now, is John bearing witness to what he has seen? No, he's bearing witness to what he's heard. How is it that Jesus is bearing witness to what he has seen? Well, what's he bearing witness to? His Father and his Father's kingdom. In what sense has Jesus seen the Father or the Father's kingdom? He is God. He comes from God. Right? So Jesus, and if you notice, when Jesus speaks and when Jesus preaches, he preaches very differently than any, anyone around him. Because you know, an, an earthly preacher is going to say, well, the scriptures say, and this is what this means. Jesus will say things like, I tell you. Now, if I were to say that, that would be arrogant. Because who am I? I'm, I am, I'm, a, I'm a fellow sheep. I'm a fellow sinner, right? What I know is what God has revealed in his word to me, the same as he's revealed to you. When Jesus speaks, though, he speaks like someone who, who knows God very closely, very intimately. He knows what God is like. He speaks of God as though he's seen God. And of course, to us, that's not a surprise. Well, of course, Jesus has seen God. He is very God. And that's what John is bearing witness to, that Jesus is speaking of, of what he has seen. Now, in, in verse 36, you have almost a repetition of what we saw in verses 16 and 17. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. So how does one obtain eternal life? Believing in the Son. Right. Eternal life comes from believing in the Son. And again, you have that repeated warning, right? Whoever does not obey the Son, and in the Greek it's really like whoever disobeys the Son, shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. So God's wrath is poured out against unbelief. Yeah, his, his whole life had been, had been leading to this. Chapter 4. Yeah, when we receive the testimony of God, we receive it entirely. Meaning, if, if you read the Bible and you, you come to realize that your belief and what the Bible says are different, you must necessarily submit yourself to the Bible 
and, and, and be changed by it. Now, of course, we are smart. Just ask us, we'll tell you. And, and because we are smart, we have all of these ways of describing away the Bible, contextualizing it. Oh, well, that, that was just because that was the olden days, and that's how they did things in the olden days. Man, the devil's gotten a lot of mileage out of that one. Um, and there are all kinds of ways that we, we, we think ourselves wise, and we contextualize away the, the scriptures, not realizing that all of that historical context is mostly not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is what we, us, need to know for salvation. Meaning these are not offhanded comments that are unimportant, but rather when we find ourselves at, at odds with the Bible, we have to, to be humble and to be changed by it. And by the way, if you find that that's not happening to you, read, read slower. <laughs> no matter who you are, you will find the Bible challenging what, what you know or what you believed. That, that process is always ongoing. It's not perfected within, a, within us this side of glory. Right, exactly. That's, that's, that's why a good teacher matters. Yeah, we, we strive at perfection, and in the process, we, we gain excellence. Yeah, you, you go back to the well of God's word, you will always find more to draw from. You, there's, there really never comes a point at which you say, well, I know all that already. As a matter of fact, the more you know of the Bible, the more you realize, I know nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm perpetually a student. I'm perpetually a beginner. I must keep coming back to God because there's so little that I do know. Right, yeah, then my sanctification's complete. And we're not Methodists. <laughs> Chapter 4. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So now is when he actually starts on his way to Galilee. And, you know, the, the Pharisees get word of this from John's disciples. Remember, they, they'd kind of spied out a couple of times what was going on with John, who this guy is, is he a threat? And now, now there's an opportunity to sow division. Oh, there's a bit of a quibble between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. Now, I don't think from the perspective of Jesus' disciples or John's disciples, there really is one. But again, some of John's disciples had the question, hey, this Jesus is, is baptizing. Now, as John tells us in chapter 4, Jesus himself really wasn't baptizing himself. That is, he himself wasn't baptizing. His disciples were. That's, a, that's, a, it's, that's not a small point. It shows you that when, when Jesus works on earth, he typically does so through his servants. So, our nature is that we will find, like, like, for example, take our own baptisms. The circumstances of our baptism are, of course, important because that's, that's part of the story of how I was brought into the church. However, the temptation is going to be, well, you were baptized by John the Baptist, but I was baptized by Jesus, so my baptism's better. This, this happens with St. Paul, right? Huh, you were baptized by St. Andrew, Pff, I was baptized by... You know, there's, there's this constant fighting about it, which is why Paul didn't baptize, although he did baptize a couple as he thought about it. Jesus didn't baptize, he baptizes through his disciples. However, in baptizing through his own disciples, Jesus was, in fact, baptizing. So you were baptized by probably a pastor, you know, um, some, you know, some man that the Lord rose you know, put in, put in place, maybe a good man, maybe not. Um, but that fact is, is, is rather minor compared to the fact that you were baptized into the name of the triune God, right? The, the, the servant that God uses is not remotely as important as God himself. Yeah, then, then you're, again, then you're calling God a liar, right? So, so the Pharisees hear about this, and they, 
they, they, they hear about this, this potential for a, 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 an argument. And because of this, Jesus leaves Judea. John is baptizing in Judea. Jesus is assisting John in his ministry. However, that ends up looking to the Pharisees like Jesus is competing with John, and Jesus does not want to interfere with John. That's why he departs to Galilee. In Galilee, he's going to find all kinds. Galilee is an open question. It's not ruled by, I mean, it's, it's ruled by Rome, as Judea is, but you don't have, like, the Jewish courts that are set up there. There are Jews living in Galilee, but they're not as numerous. They're not, they're probably not the majority. And so Galilee is the kind of place where no self-respecting Messiah would grow up, which is why we had the question earlier in John, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It, it was a somewhat obvious question. Nazareth? The Christ coming from Nazareth? Yeah. When Jesus goes to Galilee, he's going to find all kinds of people, but he's going to get a much warmer reception there among the people you wouldn't expect than he will among, among the Judeans, right, among the Jews. He came into his own, his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. In Galilee, he's going to find magnificent confessions of faith from very unlike, unlikely characters. But you don't get straight to Galilee from Judea. You have to pass through the land of Samaria. And it's, it's wonderful that we're talking about First Kings on Wednesdays because we've, we've already seen this Wednesday the kingdom divided. We talked about Jeroboam and Rehoboam and the northern ten tribes and Judah being separated into two distinct kingdoms. And Jeroboam is already setting up their own worship, his own priesthood. Again, that is the sin of Jeroboam, is his appointing priests. They're not even Levites. They're just basically warm bodies that'll, that'll do what he wants to. And they're having their own worship. And they claim that as they do that, they worship God. They also have two golden calves, yes, right. One in Bethel and one in Dan. Yeah, a lot. It's it's Aaron, but it's it's twice. It's convenient, right? You don't have to go all the way to Bethel. You can, you can stop by Dan and worship the golden calf there. No need to go to Jerusalem. No need to see your Judean brethren or your Judahite brethren. In between Samaria and Galilee is the land of Samaria. Samaria is the area that was mostly the northern kingdom of Israel during the days of the divided kingdom. Already from the time of Jeroboam, you have, you have, you have cult-like worship, you have the golden calves, you have high places, you have foreign gods, you have the Lord being worshipped contrary to the law of Moses. When, when the northern kingdom is destroyed in the year 722, the Israelites are carried away into Assyria. When they come back, they have bred with the Assyrians. And as a result, they are, in the minds of the, of the Judeans, the Judahites, they are half-breeds. Half Israelite, half Assyrian. They're not pure. They're not pure Jews. Theologically, the Samaritans have a different temple. They worship on a different mountain. Their Bible only has the first five books. They only have... So, for example, the command to worship in Jerusalem... It's not found in the books of Moses. So they just have the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. Now, that doesn't mean they follow them particularly closely. Their worship is atrociously off. But as we find with the Pharisees, having the full Bible didn't mean that they were always theologically on either. They had plenty of misconceptions of their own. Theologically, Samaria, Judea were a wreck by the time Jesus got there. And so you find those who really should have been looking for the Christ, those who should have received him first, are generally the ones who don't. And he's received by the most unlikely characters. So back to John 4.
and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he, as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. This is a familiar setup. Um, he's, he's in a far-off place. Sychar is just adjacent to Shechem. Some of the older commentaries will say it's identical with Shechem. It's probably not. It's probably just a little ways off from Shechem, but not terribly far. Jacob's well is there. That's the land that Jacob gave to Joseph. But we've, we've seen this setup before where there's a well out, you know, out of town, out kind of in the wilderness. Someone goes there to draw water. Where have we seen this setup before? Believe it or not, we talked about it with the, uh, the catechumens on Wednesday when we talked about Abraham finding a, a wife for his son Isaac. Abraham sends his, his slave Eliezer, and he goes all the way to Mesopotamia, and he sets up outside the city, finds a well. He prays to the Lord. You know, the, the, the woman whom I asked to give me drink, and she also gives the camels to drink, let that be the one. He's not even finished with the prayer, and out comes whom? Rebecca. Rebecca comes out of the city. Eliezer asks her, give me, give me water to drink. And she, being warm and hospitable, not only gives him drink, gives his camels to drink. He goes and meets her family, asks if she would come back to, to his master, uh, Abraham's son, Isaac. She will. Isaac takes Rebecca into his, his mother's tent. And now Isaac is married to Rebecca. We also find, where does Moses meet his wife? At a well. At a well. Right? Where does Jacob meet Rachel? At a well. Right? And what did we just hear John say that Jesus is? The bridegroom. Right? So, you know, bring all that with you in, into this in, encounter with this woman. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So Jesus is alone, it's just him. The disciples have gone to, to buy food, right? The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So the, the, woman, the woman knows how this encounter is supposed to go. Jesus, the Jew, is supposed to just pretend she doesn't exist. They don't even exchange pleasantries. I mean, when, when John says that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, it's a little understated. You, you don't even, you know, the, you know when, when we guys like pass each other, you know, we'll at least like give the head nod or something like acknowledging the other guys there. You don't do that with the Samaritans. They're going to look a little different. They're going to sound a little different. She obviously knows Jesus is a Jew. You know, right away. So they behave like bastards to the Romans. Basically, yeah. Not even there. You are not there. Right? And he's he's not he's not mean or cruel or rude to her either. He asks her, give me a drink. And so she's asking, you know, what what are you doing? That's not how this is supposed to go, stranger. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, living water is a double entendre, right? Because living water can refer to moving water, right? Now, the, the word here is not merely a well. The word here in, in the Greek is that it's a spring. So the water itself is moving. It's not, it, it's not stagnant water. It's not puddle water, right? Moving water is generally cleaner, fresher, healthier than stagnant water. But living water has another higher meaning, which is what? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right? This is connected with the Holy Spirit. So, 
What's that? The gift of God is. And the gift of God is. Jesus. Jesus. As Messiah. He 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 answers her a little bit cryptically. If you just knew who it was who was talking to you and who was asking you, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Now remember, the Samaritans are going to consider themselves the true sons of Jacob. You know, our father Jacob, he gave us this well. You know, you Jews have your temple in Jerusalem and all the stuff you do, but this right here is where Jacob built as well. Our father Jacob, you know what, where do you even get it? She's, she's not understanding what he's, what he's talking about. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So the, what was the problem with the water that came out of the well? Be thirsty. Everyone who drinks it will be thirsty again. Now, does that mean that the well was poisoned or there was something wrong with the water itself physically? No, he's talking about something else. It's not just a, a better source of, of water. He's talking about a different sort of water, a different meaning, right? It's not, although she doesn't let that stop her. Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now, we were told earlier, it's what time of day? It's the sixth hour, right? That means it's noon. Um, if you've ever seen the Jungle Book, you'll know that the ladies come out of the village at what time of day? Er, early mornings or sundown. Yeah, if she's coming at noon, she's coming at a time when no one's going to be there. It's like mowing your lawn here at one in the afternoon. You can do it, but you're punishing yourself, right? You mow the lawn at like eight. It's much better. You draw, you know, water's heavy. And they're going to have to haul it back into the city. So you, you at least come at a time of day when it's not so oppressively hot. The only reason you would come out in the middle of the day is either you were desperate, you were walking by, or you couldn't be seen with other people. Now, we know she wasn't walking by because she brought a pot with her. That means she came from her home. So this was on purpose. That's not incidental to the story. So Jesus promises her that whoever drinks of the water that I give will never be thirsty again. What's he talking about? Yeah, yeah this is his salvation. And this Samaritan woman is sounding to us a lot like whom? He's a lot like Nicodemus. Jesus is, is speaking of heavenly things, spiritual things. Their mind is on earthly things. I want that kind of water. But she's not asking what Nicodemus asked, which was how can these things be? She's not really interested in the how. She knows Jesus has something wonderful to give her, and she asks for it. It's, it's, it's a baby step of faith. She doesn't remotely understand what Jesus is offering, only that he's offering her something good. She trusts him enough to ask for it. And again, a Samaritan, right? It's not for nothing that Jesus makes the good guy in his very famous parable a Samaritan. The Samaritan is the last guy you would have expected to be the good guy. The priest, the Levite, those are the good guys, right? The clergy, those are the guys you would expect. Well, of course, they're the good guys. They're totally not. They're worthless. It's the Samaritan who stops and helps the man who's been beaten, right? Likewise, this, this willingness to hear Jesus is coming not from, not from a Jew, not from a Pharisee, 
coming from a Samaritan woman. And as we'll find out later in the chapter, probably next week, not just a Samaritan woman, but one who has pretty rightly been ostracized. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, Jesus knew exactly what he was asking when he asked, go call your husband. He was, he was revealing in her the whole reason this exchange is happening. And, and she, she answers, it is possible to, to lie with the truth. <laughs> right? That's basically what she does. I have no husband. Well, that's technically true, and Jesus, but Jesus, yeah, he, he reveals this in her. Yeah, you've had five husbands. The one you now have is not your husband. So in other words, the, the, the man you're living with, he hasn't even bothered to marry you. She has no husband, but she's living as though she does. Right. Yeah, what can she say? No, uh, is she going to, can she debate it? He obviously knows her so well. There's no point in debating him. Be- She's probably shocked by this. Tremendously shocking. How, because maybe someone from the town knew that, but she would have known him if he were. This is a Jew, a foreigner. He's traveling through. How could he possibly know this? So she changes the subject. Yeah. So, so she, <laughs> right, right. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship, right? Back to theology. Our fathers, us Samaritans, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you, that is you Jews, say that God should be worshipped in Jerusalem, right? Let's, Let's debate about theology. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So, he actually does rightly answer the question about theology. Yes, my people do worship in Jerusalem, as is right, but the time is coming when even that will pass away. As we saw with the cleansing of the temple, the, the temple's purpose is coming to a very, uh, very soon end. Because the need for sacrifice will be coming to an end. And the reason is that there will, there will come the one sacrifice which will atone for all the sins of the world. And because of that, there will be no need for the sacrificial system, no need for the Levitical priesthood, no need for the temple. On that day, how will people who worship the same God of the Old Testament, how will they worship him? In spirit and in truth. truth. Where is the appropriate place to worship this God? Where two or three are gathered. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. She's expressing her hope. Her hope is that Messiah will come, and when he does, he will reveal to us all things. Yeah, I mean, right. Everything is so messed up, but still the idea that Messiah would come and, and, and reveal all things still made it through to her. And she expresses this. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Whoa. Right? So finally, Jesus gets to where he was driving. He reveals himself to be the Christ. Yeah, this is the first time he says that in John, that he's the Christ. Now, you would imagine that when Jesus reveals himself to be the Christ, he would do so in a very public way to as big a crowd as possible, full of the most influential people, right? And yet, he reveals this to a Samaritan woman. 
one who probably wouldn't even have enough cachet in her own town to reveal it to those people. He's going to find faith in people like that all throughout his ministry, where the rulers seek to put him to death, the people that know their Bible the best end up knowing it the worst, because they know it, but they've had it explained away. And this woman's simple faith was enough to, to make her cry out for Messiah, and Jesus reveals to her that he is, in fact, the Christ. Yeah. Anything else on these verses? All right, next week we'll pick up with verse 27. Let's, uh, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.